Morning, everybody. Um, as I said, my name is Mark, and I'm going to be talking about maintaining your sanity while maintaining your open source app. Um, just as a show of hands, how many people have ever released an open source project on the Python package index? Yeah, Russell, have you managed to? <laughs> OK. Um, so what this talk is really about is things that you're not going to find in the Django docs about writing an app. This is about packaging an app, documenting an app, and making your app testable outside of a project context. Um, and who am I? I think this is the part where I'm supposed to convince you that I know something and that you should have come to my talk instead of talking to Alex. Uh, I'm a developer at Cactus Consulting Group. You may have heard of us. Um, and I'm also the founder and a developer for a very, very small homebrewing website um, called brewedbyus.com. Um, some apps that I've open sourced, uh, there's a long list. By PyPy downloads, it's probably Django Selectable is my, my most popular. Uh, and I've done these for work or for Brewed by Us or just for fun or just to prove my coworker wrong that it could be done. Um, and not every one of these projects fit perfectly into what I'm going to talk about. So don't you know, bash me on Twitter for not having docs on all of these. Uh, this is about what I've learned, open sourcing app after app, and things that I wish I had done earlier um, and learning through that process. But this is also about managing your time, because I don't do just work and write code more and more. I'm a husband and a dad. Uh, I'm a runner. I went running this morning. Who else went running? Nick, Julia, yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm a home brewer. So these tools are, again, to manage your sanity. So jumping into the, the thick of it, the first thing to talk about is packaging. This is a, a spot where Python has improved a lot. Um, and there are some insane things that people do when doing packaging for an open source app. This is a quote that you will never hear someone say. This app is so easy to install. You check out the repo and you add the app source directory to your Python path. So how do you keep packaging sane? Uh, you should package your app to work with pip, and you should direct your users to install with pip. Uh, there are arguments to be made that, that you don't want a dependency outside the standard library to install, but I don't care. Don't. <laughs> You can worry about that. You can fix packaging later if, if that really becomes a burden. I don't expect it will ever be a burden. So keep your sanity. Keep the choices simple. If you go through the Django docs, there's like six ways to install Django. I wouldn't recommend writing those docs. I would say the docs to install are pip install Django something. Um, so to package your app, you need uh, a file called setup.py. And this is an example that you're welcome to steal. Um, it uses setup tools or distribute. And it's very readable. I mean, it looks like magic at first, but it, it has some obvious metadata. Your package has a name. That name is unique to the Python package index. It has a version. It has an author. It has an author email. To define what the, mod, the Python modules are for your, uh, for your app. You can use uh, the setup tools, find packages. If you're including package data, which is very common, um, you know, non-Python files like HTML templates, email templates, CSS, JavaScript, you're going to want to make sure you include package data. Talk about that a little bit more in detail. And you can also add classifiers. Um, there's a full list that I'll, I'll share with you. And um, th this setup.py, for the most part, 
defines what people will see when they look on the index. So you can include a long description, which is pulled straight from your README. Um, so it's not as difficult as it may seem. You could imagine a pack, uh, an app that you've already written and what you would fill in all these fields. It's, it's quite easy to do. Um, for your application version, follow uh, PEP368. You probably already do or you've already seen this. Um, surprisingly, there are packages that don't. They have weird versioning numbers. But the versioning scheme defined by this PEP is number dot number dot number. Uh, it's very familiar. And this is just included in the uh, init.py of your, of your package. And try to be consistent about what your versions mean. This is for your users and for your own sanity. I mean, you want to sort of bump versions when you add new features or just do bug fixes. And, but the main thing is just to be consistent. Again, if you include non-Python files in your source distribution, you can use a manifest template. This is by far the easiest way to include non-Python resources. And this goes right next to your setup pi, and you include files that you might want to include. You can include single files like a readme or a license or an author's file, or you can include entire directories such as your template directory or static media directory. Once you have these few, hmm, once you have these few files in place, you simply register your package. If you haven't created a user on the Python package index, you'll have to do that here. And then you create a source distribution and you upload it to the index. This is really all it takes. To me, there's no excuse for not doing this. It's so easy. It takes two files and two commands to uh, upload a version on the index. And now your package is installable with pip. And it makes it easy on you to tell people how to install your package, and it makes it easier on you to use your package. And it really can help you uh, save a lot of heartache and questions that people might have. Another thing to help avoid needless questions is to create good documentation for your project. Um, some sort of documentation anti-patterns that you see are gigantic readme files or docs that aren't available online. Uh, another one you could say, or you might say, are auto-generated docs. Python itself is very readable, so auto-generated documentation is particularly not interesting. To me, the your documentation should describe what your source can't. And it should be things like, why did you make this project? We'll talk about more what things you should document. But the main thing here is that the problem with the giant readme is that you sort of limit yourself into what you're going to write. And because it just becomes overwhelming, or it becomes overwhelming to read. You want your users to be able to find your docs and read them, because if they can't find them and read them, then you wasted all your time writing them. So to maintain your sanity, you should use Sphinx and read the docs. They've made it so ridiculously easy. And you should create docs before you think you need them. You can think, oh, this project is so simple, it doesn't need docs. Well, they every project really does need docs at one point. Uh, so you should just start yourself down the right path to begin with. And when you write documentation, you find better ways to describe how your project works. So how do you get started with using Sphinx and read the docs? It's easy to say, use it, but how do you do it? So when you install Sphinx, you just pip install Sphinx, and it comes with a quick start command. And for the most part, the quick start, it's a list of a dozen questions. 
And it has really sane defaults. So just go ahead and use most of the defaults. The one default that I, I would change is to create a docs directory inside of your project. You've probably seen many projects that already do this. And once you go through the quick start, this is what you'll have. You'll have a docs directory with a comp py that defines the Sphinx setup. It creates an index for the, the start of your documentation, and it creates two make files to create your docs. So you, you have everything that you need to just say make HTML, and you can build a really boring set of docs that says, welcome to the docs for Django something. So things to document. You should have a description of your project and its goals. Again, this is something that you can't get from reading the source. People can understand what your models are or how they work, but no one will understand why you wrote this project in the first place unless you tell them. And you should include how to install, which is gonna be easy. It's gonna be pip install, and any requirements which you can handle in the setup py2, and how to configure. You know, walk them through those first steps. If you include models, that means they probably need to run SyncDB or migrate. If you have additional settings that people need to set, that needs to be in there. If it needs to be in installed apps to find your templates or find your models or find your template tags, You'd be surprised how many people don't think that, uh, of these steps and the questions that you'll get. So just cut them off right at the beginning. Just say, this is how you get started in this project. You might not understand how to use it entirely, but I can get you started. And release notes. Um, a git log or a hg log or a svn log are not release notes. No one will look through it when you release a new thing. And you won't look through it. You may have no idea what you did between this release and the next. You should write release notes as you create new features. And you should write release notes as you fix bugs. Use it as a source of pride for yourself. It feels so rewarding to maintain a great open source package, and it feels great to fix a bug that evaded you for so long. So say, this version, I fixed this bug, and this version, I added this awesome feature, so you should go use it. And like I said, it, write them as you fix them. Don't wait to the end to sift through the git log to try to figure out what happened. You will never find out what happened. Once you've got your docs set up, hosting on read the docs, is ridiculously easy. You create an account, you fill out a little form that points to the repo. If you followed these instructions so far and you have your nice docs directory, it just magically finds them. There's nothing to tell it. Just where you know, on the internet does your repo exist? And that may be GitHub, it may be Bitbucket, it may be Google Code or Launchpad, um, and you, for most of these providers, these open source code hosting providers, you can set up a post commit hook to tell read the docs to build your project when you make new commits. And an, often, an awesome feature that, uh, that you should take advantage of is that read the docs can build separate versions of your docs based on your tags or your branches. So you can maintain different docs for different versions. And when people are asking questions, well, I tried this thing that's in the docs, well, you're reading the wrong version of the docs. Um, because you've added new features. Um, this is how Django manages its docs. When you go to a, a set of docs and you see that little version slider at the bottom, you'll know it's on read the docs. And it's so popular because it's so easy. Um, so th this would be my recommendation for keeping your sanity on documentation. 
uh, last piece I sort of promised to talk about here is testing. I'm not going to talk about why you should test. You should know why you should test. <laughs> I'm going to try not to rant because I'm a big test advocate. So some testing insanity. I don't know how people manage their projects like this. Tests that fail when the example project is no longer there. Or tests that fail when you tweak the settings slightly. The reason you shouldn't have an example project tied to your test is that the test should ship with your app, and you shouldn't ship the example project. So your tests have to be able to run without it. And it is hard to shelter your tests on settings changes. Even Django has bugs on this occasionally. In Contrib, Auth, I think, is the worst offender. Um, but I'm going to talk about how you can work through these problems. So your tests should be extraordinarily easy to run, and they should be extraordinarily fast. Because they, if they are not easy or fast, contributors won't run them, and you will not run them. And then you might as well not really have them. But there are some quirks about Django that make it more difficult than it should be. And a big reason why people create example projects to run their tests, I would say, fall into two categories. They want models for their tests, and they want settings for their tests. And they don't know how to do it without a project. And I'm going to tell you. Test-only models. There's an open bug or open issue on Django number 7835 for test-only models. And buried deep down in the comments, you'll find Carl Meyer points out, this already works. I won't read you the whole quote. You can obviously read it yourself. And I'll also tell you that this approach that he describes in this comment is already used in Django's own test suite. And I use it on Django Selectable because it works like a charm. You don't just have to have a test PY if you have a larger test package. If you put them in the init, they'll get, they'll get synced when you run the test. It works. And I'm not really worried about this changing on trunk and, or master and breaking, because I have a test suite. I'll kind of know uh, if it changes. So test-only models, the, that excuse is gone. Follow this approach, it works. It's really easy. You just write models, you just put them in a slightly different place. Now settings are another thing that there's a fairly easy way to get around this. And what I typically do is use this little run test PY. And it's adapted from a project that uh, Brian Rosner open sourced a while ago, which I'm not positive works on the latest Django. But essentially, it's a single Python file which configures the necessary, or the necessary settings, and it runs the Django test suite for a single app which is my app, my mythical app that I'm talking about, Django something. And it really does not take very many settings to run a very small Django app. Uh, you need a database if you have models. Um, you need to include your app in installed apps. The secret key is really only required on master. Uh, the site ID is really only required if you are using Django sites or contrib sites. A root URL comp is only required if you are trying to reverse URL patterns in your app. So if your app doesn't have any views, which is possible, it may just be a middleware, it may just be a set of template tags, you might not need this. Really. The minimal set of settings is a database and then installed apps. So you don't need an entire example project to 
run your test. You can create a, a file like this and just say Python run tests. And once you've done this, you can supercharge your tests with Tox. Tox is amazingly awesome. It uses virtual M to build a test matrix to run your test in different environments using different dependencies. So you can test your app against different Python versions, different Django versions, different DB backends, because once you start using newer versions of Python, it's really easy to break compatibility uh, with older ones when you start using new features. Or newer versions of Django, you start using new shortcuts and you forget that it's not gonna work for everyone. Uh, so a basic Tox configuration is a simple uh, config style INI file. Um, you create a set of environments and then you define the commands to execute for those environments. So this uses the little run test PY that I wrote and it executes it to run the tests on the latest 1.4 dot release and the latest 1.3 dot release. And to run this, you simply say tox, and it will run all the tests in both environments, or you can run a single environment. And if you read the tox documentation, they also have a handy note of how you can build your Sphinx docs using tox. So you can know whether, it's not gonna find typos, which is my biggest problem, but you can know whether your docs build correctly before they get to read the docs. Um, so here, you can, you can manage those problems of not accidentally breaking backwards compatibility and having a user say, hey, this doesn't work on Django 1.3 anymore, or um, this doesn't work on uh, Python 2.6. So why bother doing this? Right now it seems like I'm adding a bunch of extra work and, open, and maintaining an open source app isn't supposed to be more work. But these tools help you write better code, write better docs, and they help your users help themselves. They can run the tests themselves, they can build the docs themselves, they can do all these things that you don't have to tell them how to do it. Um, or it's not a lot of steps. And you have things in place where if someone reports a bug in a particular environment that maybe you weren't testing, it's so easy to add a new tox environment and run those tests. And it gives your contributors a starting point to add more. You don't have to have flawless docs the first time you release a package, but if you have that thing in place, people can contribute patches to your docs. If you don't write some docs to start with, no one's gonna write those first docs for you. But not every problem is solved by code. There are some non-code things to do. And I've hinted at these before. You should really state your goals. You should say the problem that you are trying to solve with this project, and you should tell people the problems that you're not interested in solving. You might not be interested because it might not be your main use case, or you just wanna keep the scope small. Or you might not be interested because you already know that that other problem is solved better by some other project. You should include a license. People need to know how they can use your code. Um, there are plenty of great licenses. You can read the open source initiatives list on uh, open source licensing, but Again, people particularly in uh, you know, corporate environments or in, in work environments need to know, can I use this code for a client or can I use this on my internal application? Um, but you're welcome to choose a restrictive license, um, but you should choose one. You should remove that ambiguity and you should prepare for the future. You should be ready for new Django releases, and you should be ready for Python 3, which are sort of tied together now. <laughs> the, 
Django releases typically come around every nine months to a year. The betas are about three months, and it's in feature freeze. And with this talk setup, you should know whether your tests pass on the latest beta. There's really not an excuse for waiting for a user to tell you that this breaks on the newest release. You had three months to know. Or your users, again, will be able to tell you ahead of time because they'll have the infrastructure in place to add a new tox environment and do it. And Python 3 is coming, so your app should be prepared for that. And it, again, this is a place where tox really helps. And the last thing is that you should be ready to be replaced. Uh, it may be your, yourself as a person. Who else can take over this app? Probably some of my coworkers could take over some of my apps if I felt wary of maintaining them. Or another thing would just be I would tell someone to go use another project because I know the other projects that solve similar problems and I would just point them there. Uh, some things to avoid non-coding related is rejecting every contribution. You can't make it impossible for people to help you. You will never maintain your sanity by only writing all this code yourself. But if you do have to reject a request, you need to be nice. Uh, I, it's a kind of a pet peeve of mine to see this. It doesn't help to say this needs docs and tests. Not everyone is good at writing docs and tests, particularly people that maybe aren't native English speakers don't know how to write, you know, don't know uh, or aren't good at writing the, the best docs. You can't just say this needs docs and tests. You need to point them to say, here are some similar tests, here are some similar docs, this is where it could be expanded. Some people need more direction. This needs docs and tests doesn't give any direction. It just, it's heckling. The other thing you should not do is accept every contribution. Um, accepting every contribution just adds more for you to maintain. And that might not be something that you want to do. Adding features, adding code is so easy. That's what we're bred to do. We're programmers. Every problem can be solved with code. Well, not if you're trying to maintain an open source package and your sanity at the same time. Uh, removing features is extraordinarily hard. Many features can really start out as just documentation. This is a common use case. This is how you might solve it. And if people find that they're constantly copying and pasting the example from your doc, maybe it could be included uh, into the code. And if you accept a contribution, you need to be prepared to maintain it. Because in my experience, just because someone gives you a pull request and it has some tests, uh, that doesn't mean that they're going to help you maintain that feature as you need to support newer Django versions, newer Python versions. Um, as people want to expand on this feature, they're not necessarily going to be the ones that help you. So you need to keep the scope uh, of your project clear. And you should avoid getting burnt out. It's okay to leave your project sitting idle for a while. You don't owe anything to the people that use your project to fix every bug instantly. You've put these tools in place for them to be able to maintain this sort of on the side in your absence. Um, and you shouldn't let open source feel like a burden. It should feel easy and it should feel uh, great. It, it, it should feel uh, like you're giving something. So to sort of wrap it up, I've created a little project that uses the start app uh, extension in 1.4 that has these ideas. And it will give you a tox file. It will give you 
your setup py and your manifest template already. So if you're creating an open source app, use it, fork it, tell me which things I got wrong. Um, just share your code. It's such a great feeling to have code that other people want to use and are interested in using. Um, and some other resources that you'll find, a packaging guide and classifiers, and, and docs on some of the things I touched on. Uh, so I want to thank you for coming and listening to me. You can find these slides online, so if you didn't see those links, they went by pretty fast. Uh, you can see the full HTML on GitHub pages and the source code, and you can see some of my projects um, on GitHub and Bitbucket. So if there are any questions, again, thank you for, for coming to my talk. Thank you very much, Mark. If anyone does have any questions, just please form an orderly rabble behind me. Um, I'll kick, kick things off. Uh, one, just as a point of clarification, you raised the thing about the test-only models. It does work really well. Django's own test suite does do it. There is a reason why we haven't made a big noise about it. It's mostly to do with the way that the application um, uh, application cache works. Um, mm. Because once something has been loaded in, all of a sudden it's in the app cache. And if your test is around whether or not a model does or doesn't exist, it can get a bit hairy. Hopefully that's something we'll be able to address with the app refactor, which is an eternal project we're trying to finally finish off, and Preston, if he's around, I don't know, um, uh, we'll be able to fix that one and, and get that actually out the, out the door. The question, um, I'm obviously a Django core developer. What could the Django's core be doing to improve on any of these situations? Is there anything that we, as a, as a, as a the, the project which you're advocating people writing apps for, what could we be doing better to, to help that community? Well, I think one thing that if you just want to compare Django to some other competing projects, um, Flask actually has great documentation on how to create a Flask extension and how to share and open source your Flask extension. And I think having some of this type of information in the Django docs, like how you can create a good reusable package because the tutorial takes you through creating a project and creating an app for that project and having something where you're developing a project outside of an application, or of developing an app outside of a project context, how to do that well and how to package that um, would be helpful. Okay, so um, my question is, I love, I love PIP, I love PyPy, but um, one of the issues is it tends to go down more than it should. So uh, like PyPy specifically. Um, what would you suggest as a, as a way to, to have a mirror? Um, I usually use uh, GitHub the, the, you know, in the requirements.txt, but is there any other well-known method for, for having an alternative to, to PyPy when it goes down? Well, there are a number of, of projects that are written in, in varying languages. Uh, or not in varying languages, but in, in varying frameworks for creating your own mirror. It really does not take much to create a mirror. Really, you just need a uh, to serve a directory properly. Uh, so you need to get the downloadable files uh, from that. But that's something that I think has been improving. There are half a dozen PyPy mirrors now. And you can certainly point directly to GitHub. Um, though GitHub goes down as well. Uh, so it's not a, I, I wouldn't say that there's a, there's a general solution. Another thing is you can simply, um, uh, w when you want to do some deployment issues, you can download all the source, and then you can tell to pip install from a directory on the local file system, so that if you're deploying to multiple servers that they're not each trying to, to hit the index. Uh, but mirroring PyPy is a, is a general problem, that, uh, but it, it's getting better. Thank you. Great talk. Um, so I'm curious, so I've written tons and tons of code, and every time I, I write another package, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm totally going to open source this, and there's so many people I would love to show this to, but I just need to fix these few things, and I just need to make that code that looks like a mess but works great. I just need to clean that up, and I think it kind of becomes this like pursuit of endless pursuit of perfection. And so, do you have any advice around like, okay, so I've 
I've written my docs and I've written my tests, like, but what about any, any guidance about when is, when should the code, when should I just let go and put it out there and start publicly pushing bugs, bug fixes and whatnot? Well, I think the Stack Overflow guys said this really well about, more about general applications, that if you're not embarrassed by the 1.0 release, then you didn't release early enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for me, I think um, there will always be those problems, but uh, one thing that I think maybe not enough projects do is use their own issue tracker you'll see a lot of things where people have taken an app that they've written inside a project, they pull it outside the project, they put it up, there's one commit that says, I wrote all the code, and they push it up, there's no issues. Okay. And what you should do is just release it and say, these are the things I know I want to fix. Cool. And let people know like you're working on it or that you're thinking of it. Or if they want to contribute, like here's some obvious places where they can start. So, I mean, having flaws in your open source project, that's called having an open source project. I mean, cool. I, wouldn't worry, I wouldn't worry about it. You just have to free yourself of that, of that burden. And like I said, put them someplace where everyone can see it. Just make it visible um, that you know it's an issue. Um, and that, like I said, it gives people a, a point to contribute. Awesome, thanks. So you just touched on this a little bit with the previous question, but, um, a lot of the time when people are working on some interesting Django code, it's not because they're actually set out, set out to write a new app, a reusable app, but they just they had a project for work, or they had a project for their you know, own time, and then all of a sudden, oh, this is actually a useful feature, maybe other people would want to use this too, but it's stuck in all the gobbledygook of the specific project. Um, so, I mean, your template is great if you're starting from scratch with the intent to actually make something that other people can find useful. Um, but I was wondering if you had any advice for going back and extracting out um, something reusable from something that wasn't really intended uh, to be reused. I think that to go back is almost impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Part of my secret subplot of creating this template is that so people will stop trying to do that. Um, I think the better way, in my opinion, is to treat the app that you wrote inside your project as that prototype. And then say, I'm gonna reuse as much of this code as I can, but really I'm gonna extract the minimal working thing that makes this reusable. Because there's gonna be a ton of sort of project interdependency things. And you have to think about slimming it down and just taking out the pieces that people need. And it's easy to sort of extract more features and add new releases and, and, and show how this reusable app grows to fit some of the features that you did. I think that pulling an app out of an existing project is nine times out of 10 almost completely impossible. I've done it and I always have some import that doesn't exist and, uh, or, or something that I thought this was a great idea that no one wants. Um, I just wanted it for my project. And, and another thing to get you thinking about is, okay, well, if I'm not gonna include this feature in, the, in this reusable app, but I want it, then I need to design my app in a way that I can do this extension easy. And I think it, that actually helps you write a better app, a better reusable app when you think about well, here's my use case, and I'm gonna create this app, and it's not gonna come, it's not gonna ship with this feature, but that should be an easy extension. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Okay, we now have a 10-minute break. We're back in this room with Majumbe Po talking about Backbone. <laughs> 